Queer games are important. We're going to stop and meditate on this slide for a minute. So read it to yourself, you know, mouth it silently or out loud, that's fine too. Internalize it, absorb it into your mind brain. Allow it to influence the discussions and conversations you're going to have here at the conference and in the diaspora after you leave. Queer games are important. I think there are people here who recognize that fact because, in fact, a number of queer games were invited to be part of the, um, this games festival, be recognized as being among the most important games of 2012, or rather the most important independent games of 2012. Each of these games was, in fact, produced by a handful of people each, almost all of them. Um, queer games, it may shock you to discover, are not coming from the mainstream video games industry. That's because the dominant industry model doesn't really allow for them. Um, for reference, that model is straight white developers produce games that straight white games journalists <laughs> market to straight white gamers, some of whom will be recruited to be the next generation of game developers and the next generation of game journalists who will produce this next generation of the same video game to market to the next generation of straight white gamers. This is the industry model, or if you prefer, we could call it a vortex or maybe a black hole. When I think of the amazing things we could be doing with video games, prison seems the most accurate term. Naturally, a system that only privileges a small minority of people, in fact, the one group of people that has the least experience of oppression, is not one that's going to produce art informed by a very wide range of human experiences or perspectives. Mainstream games culture is monolithic. In fact, I wrote a book about it. <laughs> The most, the most that the mainstream games industry has to offer queer folks is tokenism. Mass Effect, as an example, um, presents a world where the bro dude Commander Shepard is more thrown by someone claiming to believe in God than he is by a man casually speaking about his ex-husband. In this world, Gay is a checkbox on a character sheet, a Boolean, a binary bit, not an experience that greatly influences one's life, identity, and struggle. Token characters are not the product of queer experiences. Actual queer exp experiences offer perspectives on identity, on struggle, and on romance that could be entirely different. My friend Maddie Bryce, hey Maddie. <laughs> wrote about this very thing. She argues that most straight games are interested only in the pursuit. Once the girl, or if you're playing a Bioware game and you've checked the right checkbox, the boy, has been won over, the game stops being interested. Whereas queer games tend to explore the actual dynamics within the relationship. Um, for example, games where Christine loves, don't take it personally, babe, it just ain't your story and my Encyclopedia Fuck Me in the Case of the Vanishing Entree, both games with tremendous names. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and Mass Effect 3 was the control group. Um, games by queer people, by people of color, by people who aren't able-bodied, by people who are women, because in 2012, women are still a marginalized voice within the games industry, have a great deal of perspective and experience to offer an industry that is incapable of producing games from those perspectives. So if mainstream games culture has no place for these perspectives, where do they go? Mainstream games having no place for them, marginalized people have had to create a space for themselves in video games. 
And that's exactly what they've done by inventing new communities and repurposing existing tools. This is a program called Twine. It was created in 2009 by a guy named Chris Klimas. It's a hypertext tool. Chris used it mostly to make simple branching stories. You click on a link, you see another passage in the story. This is what the program looks like on the inside. Um, it doesn't look like code, know this. The tech community is pretty famously misogynist. Remember, women aren't generally encouraged to pr pursue tech careers in the first place. Once they do, they're discouraged from staying by a hostile culture of entitled men. But Twine doesn't involve coding. It doesn't require the author to create additional assets, graphics, and sound. It's free. If you can type a short story, you can make a Twine game. And queer and women authors, strongly discouraged from participating in mainstream games culture, have made Twine their own. I've been curating an ongoing list of Twine games. And what I've noticed is that most of the people who are making them are women, queer, trans, genderqueer. Compare this to this. It's an entirely different picture of video games that looks completely different. This video game is informed by perspectives and experiences that are often very different from these guys deals with subjects that are very different than those that we usually see in mainstream games. Communities like this exist because of the inventiveness of marginalized people. <laughs> Have a moment. Communities like this exist because of the inventiveness of marginalized people and their will to be heard even when the system is committed to silencing them. But they also exist because of programs like Twine, because of free blogging services like Twitter, because of the internet. All these things have contributed to the decentralization of the means to create video games. And that's what, what's letting people outside the mainstream outside the small minority who are already allowed to make video games get their foot in the door. The more people we allow to make games, the more people we empower to make games, the more voices we add to the chorus. And in a form that's so homogenous, we need those voices so badly. In a form that's so dominated by senseless, gratuitous violence, it took a game like Lim by Merit Kopis, a simple abstract game about colored squares, to remind me that violence in video games can be harrowing, can make me feel, can connect with my own fears and struggles and experiencing experiences, excuse me. Violence doesn't have to be chainsaws and aliens and sniper rifles. Lim is a game about a color changing square in a world where most squares are either brown or blue and react with hostility, the blue ones more than the brown ones, when your color doesn't match theirs. By holding a button, the player can change color to blend in with the squares that are closest to her. Though this causes, this causes the player and the square great psychological stress and it becomes, it becomes difficult to maintain the illusion indefinitely. It's such an abstract game that I'm reluctant to diminish its power by ascribing any one meaning to it. But to me, as a trans woman, the metaphor that I see is one about passing, about being slippery in a world of rigidly defined genders who will smother, silence, or destroy what doesn't fit. It's the kind of um, experience that straight, white, able-bodied, cisgender men are least equipped to give us. And our games, our form, the boundaries of our experience would be smaller and dimmer without games like this. The more voices speaking, the more games begin to look like you and me and all of us. 
for lack of voices, all we would have is silence. Um, I'm going to open up for questions, but first I would like to um, leave you with my closing thought. Thank you. <laughs>